So let's talk about <clears throat> single, root, single root IO virtualization. There's a lot of interesting things going on there. Probably in what I remember the last year, the two biggest areas of change are the whole concept of hot plugging a host bridge, which Ying Hai has been doing a lot of work on. And I predict that this is going to get, this area is going to get a lot of attention. If, we'll see if I'm right, but I think this year this area is going to get a lot of attention. Seems to be a lot of devices are coming out now with this support, and we're seeing a lot of customers that are interested in this. So. So the way that SRIOV is a device says that it's capable is it has an extended capability structure and the P, uh, PCIe extended capability structure. I think it's hex 10 is the ID for it. This is a LSPCI of a Ethernet, Internet, uh, Internet, Intel device that supports SRIOV. Um, Probably the key things to note, just and, and I'm just trying to set a little context and background here, is that you probably do need ARI capability, the Advanced Alternative Routing ID Interpretation, um, especially if you're going to have more than eight devices. Um, but if you are going to have virtualization, um, you're going to have the key fields are the total VFs. This is the ceiling, how many it can support. Um, the number of VFs, this is how many are active. So that could be zero if it's not active or anything less than eight. Um, there's an offset field. We'll talk about this in a minute. This is a pretty funky number. And then a stride. Um, those are kind of the key fields that you need to be aware of to, that are involved with setting up SROV. So how does the kernel instantiate them? How do, how do we get there? Originally, it was a module-based method in which you brought up the device. Um, it got going. Then you would bring down the device and bring it back up, specifying a module parameter, in this case, max VFS 7. So you're going to bring up this IGB device and have 7 VFS. Um, this had a couple of issues. One is that um, it requires system and mid privilege typically to do the mod probe, bring it up and down, down and up. And probably the bigger one, at least in my opinion, was that it's, it was only a, a system-wide basis. And so what does that mean? Well, picture your, device, your platform having two of these capable devices but you only want one of them to support SRIOV. The other one you don't care about, you don't need, you don't even want because of resource constraints or whatever. Well, with this module-based approach, it's going to try to, it's all or nothing. So that was probably the bigger issue in my opinion. So as Bjorn just mentioned last year, Don Dutile tackled that. And he came up with a new SFS, SysFS-based uh, method that was introduced in 3.8. Um, there's the three patches, the three key patches. Um, but what he introduced was two kind of higher level things. The first one being there's now two SysFS entries associated with a SRIOV capable PCIe device. And the two are the SRIOV total VFSs. And that, again, is the ceiling. And that comes out. That value comes directly from that um, extended capability that we just looked at a minute ago. Um, drivers can change this so you can set a lower ceiling so that even though your NIC is capable of 64, for some reason you're going to clamp it off at 32. The driver can do that. Um, and then how do you enable them and how do you tell how many there are? You set this value in. in a, SysFS. And so here's an example of how you do that. Um, 
Yes. Yes. Well, I think you can set total VMs on a per device basis too. Well, yeah, this I didn't. <laughs> I didn't have room, but this would be the targeting the device right here. So they're both on a device level. Okay. So he introduced these SysFS um, values, but also um, there's a couple of calls, SRIOV configure and possibly PCI SRIOV set total VFSs. That would be the... Uh, interfaces for the driver to utilize. Um, so that's the second part that he added, the code and the gets. So that's the interface between the driver and the PCI core there. Um, so, you know, we're in this transition phase. The SysFS base is preferred going forward. We may end up deprecating the module parameter base, but we're in no hurry. Things are going and working. But if you're gonna, if, That's a good lead in to one of the issues that we want to talk about. <laughs> but the only point here is, you know, if you have a driver, is it the old way, the new way, or possibly both? I think um, when I looked at this file last, it actually has both mechanisms. It's capable of both mechanisms, so it's an interesting one to look at. But, you know, the key would be the old way, look for something like these two lines, and the new way, the SROV configure, and possibly the. So. It's specific to the driver, but if you have uh, more than one IGB device, it's going to affect all of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good good point. So the last little background here. So last year we had a very long discussion and really never got to any resolution on it. But if you have a Nick, that can be capable of a lot of virtual functions. Um, either it's capable of a lot, or you've got a really large offset, or your stride. But if you take this math and start with this, you add the offset, and then virtual function times the stride, that'll give you the ID for your first, well, for your first, second, third, do in virtual function. If that goes past 255, if you think about um, ARI and how that works, it kind of glues together the device and function ID and treats them as one hunk. Then you're getting into a new bus. You can transition over to a new bus. And if that happens, um, we do put a PCI bus structure in place and things are... But the interesting thing is that PCI bus that was put in place to handle these VFs that are out there, and you could have more than one. There's really no connection back to the original PF's PCI bus. Um, it's kind of a chain that's out there on its own. Like I said, we talked about that last year, and that's still a problem out there that's lingering as far as I know, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so now let's talk about other issues that we're aware of currently. So the creation of the, this kind of is, is what Alex just asked about a while ago. Creation of VFs is uh, under the control of the, pre the physical function driver. And there's some uniqueness, and we're wondering if we can maybe make them less unique or special. Um, this isn't so much a problem, but it's kind of interesting in that there's some asymmetry or uniqueness. Um, Yesterday in Raphael's talk, he talked about PM, and he had some slides. And 
I apologize, I don't remember which one it was, but it was really nice. Typically, when you're setting something up, you're going to go through some sequence, A through G, in a nice order and get it set up. And then later when you're tearing it down, you typically go G through A backward and tear it down. And there's a nice symmetry. You're setting up and taking down, um, and you can see that, and it's real smooth. With the VFs, there's kind of two interesting things going on that aren't so symmetric. Um, the core enumerates the physical function initially, then you call the driver probe function, and then the driver, in uh, the driver enables SROV because when it comes out of reset, the device, the VFs have to be disabled. That's one of the things specified in the spec. Um, so that gets the driver to enable them, and then for the VFs, um, you call to the core to add those, and you, you, know, it's, you kind of repeat this, so it's a little weird. And you're, in one, the driver's doing it, and the other, the core is getting in there. So that's a little interesting. But probably a lot more interesting is the removal path. That, that one just gets weird. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, you would think that you're going to remove the VFs first, kind of the opposite order, and then remove the PF. Um, but that's really got some interesting problems associated with it. So the only point I want to make here is, you know, the, the asymmetry, and maybe this is part of the uniqueness that we can perhaps, perhaps it's um, part of the problem. These two slides are just showing some of the call paths of instantiation of the PF and VF. So um, when you go home and you're thinking about this problem and you're going to work on it, you can look at those for reference. There's, we're not going to go through those. But what should we do with the VFs when the driver releases the physical function? So Currently, the VFs are only torn down if the physical function driver explicitly does it. So this would be the driver. So let's talk about I, IGB, the example that we had earlier. Um, well, I don't want to pick on the driver. Let's just use it as a general example because you know it may or may not tear them down, and that's the whole point. The the huh? <laughs> well. I just don't want to because maybe it's one of the ones that nicely tears them down, you know. Well, Some, yeah, what it comes down to is we have to do a check to see whether or not any of the VFs are assigned to a guest. If they are, we can't tear down the VFs because they'll hang the whole system between them and SIS problem. Okay, so there's another problem. Then feel free to bring these up. And those are the kinds of things we really want to log, please. So, so, so bring that up again in a minute and let's... I think we can come up with probably about six problems that we can identify, you know, and that's the whole point of being here. So, you know, start speaking up at this point. This is this is where we want it to get interactive. So, go ahead.
Can you try to speak louder, Alex? <laughs> yeah, we, we can do that. So the reset problem that you mentioned, um, you did some nice research, um, reset cleanup recently, and you pulled those in, right, Bjorn, in the last pull? Did, did those touch this at all? All right. So, good. We're identifying problems, <laughs> two already at least. <laughs> um, the MSIX teardown and some reset. Um, fortunately, I know Alex and we're fairly co-located so we can get together and talk about that. The point I wanted to bring up was, and I'm going to repeat this a little bit because I think it's weird and we're going to get there. You know, again, it's the virtual functions that remove, or it's the physical function driver that removes the virtual functions. There's, uh, so that's done explicitly by the driver. There's no support for that in the PCI core. So the standard method of PCI stop and remove bus device, um, the PCI core does not do this. Um, and this leads to a special, a couple of special cases. One is in the SysFS work that Don Dutile did, there is not an entry to remove a VF um, with other PCI devices. There's typically a remove um, function in SysFS and you can echo to that to simulate a hot plug, for example. Maybe not exactly, but it's close enough. Um, But what I think is interesting is, should we allow the virtual functions to remain in existence when the PF driver is um, detached, which leads into exactly what both of you were talking about. So if you have a hardware device, and this is la lifetime here, and then you have a PF device, and its lifetime ends here, well, right now, believe it or not, the current implementation where some drivers um, the VFs remain in existence. And so, go ahead. Driver does mean that the VF doesn't have the elements, right? Right. It's just a driver binding. Yes. So, at least in the case of the IGP, the IGP driver is on the other side there. The way we end up doing is that total VF value persists outside of the driver. And so when you reload the driver, it reads that value back in and then re enables all those VFs. Yep. And this is, okay, so Raphael's. Go ahead. You said total VFs, but did you mean known VFs? Well, known VFs is the module for a user. Total is the ceiling. Okay, known VFs lives outside, so you can pull that volume back in and uh, start the driver. Because you can't change it. See, that's the thing. But that's where I mean, once something decides to use that MSIX button, we can't do anything that modifies the number of VFs. Right. So yeah. we can't reload the driver. We have to reload with the exact same number of VFs we had with the previous instance of the driver. True, but I don't think the core stores an MVS, so where do we get that? Well, do we read it out of the capability? I think the SysFS still holds on to it. Hmm. Well, Not actually, maybe, yeah, I think we might, there's a, in the IOB, there's a, the NumVS body, that's what it is. Oh. NumVS is part of the IOB structure on the PCI device. Okay. And so what we end up doing is we pull that back in and we reconfigure the device for that number of VMs. Oh, so, you're, so it's caching it. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, 
What's the use case for unloading and reloading the PF driver? Upgrading the PF driver uh, without having to, you know, because that's the big one. It'd be changing out one PF driver or one PF driver for another PF driver. Well, leaving the VF active. Yep. How valuable is that? Depends on what you're doing. See, that's the thing. In our case, we have a big validation team that likes to change drivers often. They don't like to have to tear down everything to change the driver. So that was where a lot of this came from. Is they unload the driver. What about a real... You're signing yourself up for a lot of <laughs> coordination to make sure that different PF driver versions are compatible with the yep. VF driver. Well, we already have all that in common. We have like an API in our setup that can detect the uh, mailbox operations. Okay, what version of VF is over here? What version of VF is over here? Okay, we're going to talk this protocol now instead of you know, some older one. Yes, it, it just looks like the cable is unplugged. Okay, so to try to rehash some of this, the point Raphael brought up is really important. Um, I was saying that the VFs are kind of left in this orphan state if the PF detaches, if the driver detaches. The device is still there. It's still good. It's still up. Um, it's just that the driver detached. So that's a very good point that Raphael brought up. So keep that in mind. And you're both talking about that. I think it's weird that these guys are left orphaned. Um, some people like it, obviously. Um, Don Dutile, who did the SysFS, also liked it. His logic was, um, as I mentioned, to the VF, it just looks, okay, back up. If you, just a plain vanilla machine, no virtualization or anything, we've all seen your network go away and then you find out it's some demon came around and unplugged your cable. You plug your cable back in and you're good to go again. That's what it would look like to the VF in this orphan case if the driver were reattached because it will find and, and get synced back up. the Broadcom next. Oh, to one guest? Yeah, you can't split them up if you have multiple uh, VFs. Right. Because it's I believe the right ACS support or something? Or? I think that's how the NIC is implemented. But, you, you know, I'm saying focusing on one NIC and one driver and deciding the design might, um, if it does it work well with other NICs. As yeah, well, and, I'm not, and I'm not wanting to focus on one driver right. here. I keep saying IGB and all, you know, just, that's, I've made that mistake. Let's not oh. focus on one driver. But that, yeah, no, but this is a very good point. You know, different drivers are going to have different dependencies, and so we're going to have to handle these kinds of things. And, 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 and I do know in one case where uh, one of the Broadcom NICs, you will, they have the same driver, right? I mean, in this case, in IXGB, you have two different drivers, physical function and virtual function, but not in the case of all of the SRIOV drivers. Some SRIOV drivers do have the same one driver that does both functions. So just to get others involved, show of hands, who, who, who thinks this is interesting, kind of strange, you know, that the, you got these orphans around here left? No one? 
<laughs> I do. <laughs> well, I think it's strange because it, it's... <coughs> core is sort of at the mercy of the PF driver to do the teardown correctly. Yeah. And we need to, that's a bug that we need to fix because if we have to move the P out, somebody's got to clean up the V out. And yeah. today, if the driver doesn't do it, nobody does it. I was about to ask how, how that plays with hot plug, and I don't think it plays at all. Yeah, it, I mean, it, with hot plug, I think it gets torn down. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, so they don't get torn down nicely, but yeah, that's another. That's yeah. Yeah. Um, but you guys seem to like this persistence, um, and if the device comes back up, you know. In a, in a real customer world scenario, is there really value in keeping that, these orphans and having them reattach? Or is this just us geeky engineers that like this and gives well, you know, device drivers well, updates and all? Right, but if we solve these other problems, would, would this still be a valued function for some reason? or, or Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the thing is the PF device is still there. It's just the PF driver isn't there. And the way the hardware is set up, the configuration space is still there for all the BS. It's just they go in and they try to send network traffic and it doesn't do anything because the PF didn't enable them. So essentially that's why, at least for network drivers, it's set up such that the VF cannot detect the PF there. It just treats it as a link down event. It just sits there. Won't transmit, won't receive anything. From a network perspective, that's the perfect match for it. That's the state it's in. What's going to happen if you truly hot plug it? Then, what happens if you truly hot plug the device? Like, you pull it out. Well, yeah, then, then you end up leaking the VF uh, resources. They probably end up re returning uh, all apps. Even if it became a zombie, effectively? I don't know. Would you rather you can only reboot the VM anyway, right? Yeah. Would you rather crash it immediately or yeah. switchable behavior? What speak up a little? It seems like it's a switchable behavior. So you just trigger a hot button call and you move the device in the VM, you tear down the VM before you kill the VM or option with the new button and you So good. Actually, I don't see a big deal with keeping those VFs alive, except that when a new driver rolls, because the new driver has to deal with that, right? That mm -hmm. they are present, because if you load the driver for the first time, then the VFs are not there, and the driver creates them, kind of. And then when you, <clears throat> when you leave them after the driver has gone, then a new driver has to deal with the existing VFs already, right? So that's yeah. the only problem you need to solve with that, I think. All right. Can people uh, up here? I can't tell. Does the microphone seem to do anything? I've, yeah, that's my impression too. Even when it's on. Um, so try to speak loud, you know, please. All right. So, you know, it's not the first time I've thought something's weird and people like it. You know. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, so right now, there's, you know, we talked about this. It's the driver right now that's tearing down the VFs if they get torn down. Um, typically, devices, PCI devices, have the following remove capability. You can do something like echo one to something, and it's a remove file, and simulate a hot plug event. It tries to unbind the driver. No, it removes the device. No, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Should we have this capability in SysFS on a per VF basis? Right now, there's not. Um, so that's another discussion point, potentially. Um, does anyone? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for at least speaking up, yeah. Which is back to that whole asymmetry thing. If we could get some of that cleaned up, I think some of this would go away. That's the whole point of bringing that part up. So there's, there's two ways you could think about the asymmetry. I mean, we, today we have the driver turns on ILB. It may or may not turn it off. So we could fix the asymmetry by requiring the driver to turn off the VS, or we could change it so that we could enable the VS before the PS driver. Right. Yeah. And allow them to persist after. In yeah. which case the driver has to go into text, which is what we already do to that number of VS is always yeah, well, set. We need to know the that, <coughs> right? Because the, the VS might be better. So the driver has to do it with that. Right. But we don't really have a mechanism to turn on IOV before the PS driver today. Yeah, today, but we could probably yeah. Yeah, if we if it makes sense to move that in the core that may <laughs> it seems like I was talking to someone earlier this week that liked the idea of instantiating the VFs before the PF 
but I can't remember who it was. Was that it, was it you, Alex? No. Okay. All right. Um, so if we put a mechanism in place, because Alex likes it, <laughs> should there conversely be a way to uh, add them? Well, there's not a way today to add an individual nope. arbitrary PCI device, is there? Other than rescan. I wanted them to go away, but it seems like there may be valid reasons for them to stick around. <laughs> yeah. And part of the reason that some of this uniqueness exists may be, I guess it's worth mentioning, it, it's, it's due to the device itself. Um, when an SRILV device comes out of reset, power on, whatever, it's required that the VFs are disabled. And so that's interesting. And part of that might be, and I've seen this, I actually worked with a card and it really wigged me out until I read the spec more and said, okay, I think I know what's going on. I was manipulating some of the values And I, you know, it's been long enough, more than two weeks ago. I was manipulating some of these values. I don't know what. And then other values would change. And so I'd bring up the card. I would see these, some same values, get used to it. I'd played with some values, bring it up again. And my whole world changed. And I said, like, wait, I just changed one value. What happened? And what happened is the... The, there's some firmware on the card itself, at least this card that I was with, and it would detect. And if you read the spec, and I don't remember the values, but if you manipulate some of these values, the card can do some heuristics and go change um, some other values. And so I think those two reasons, coming out of reset that it's disabled, and there's a couple of values that if you change, it can propagate and make a lot of changes, more changes. Um, based on heuristics from the card. I think those two kind of historically have played into this whole, okay, we've got the PF up first and then we'll create VFs. Whether that's really, really required or not, maybe we need to think about, because I like this idea of maybe the VFs coming up and getting more symmetry and moving some things into the core. And oh, yeah. Yeah, there's some values that the game's over if you change. <laughs>
yeah, this stuff scares me enough. I don't want to think about migration or multi-root SRIOV because, yeah, there's a MRIOV. So. All right, so good discussion. We've got 